coming up on Chopper's election podcast. Theresa May's deal wasn't Brexity enough for Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson's deal wasn't Brexity enough for Nigel Farage. He's come in behind it in the last few days, but still, you know, he has his reservations. If the government is so convinced that this is what the country wants, then take it back to the country. Hello and welcome to Chopper's Election Podcast. My name is Christopher Hope and I'm the Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent. I'm two coffees down at the Red Lion Pub, my favourite haunt in Westminster, waiting for this week's stellar lineup to turn up. Packs between parties, spats over spending and of course Brexit. That's really the focus of this week's campaigning in the 2019 general election and will no doubt dominate conversation today. Until now, the election has felt to me like the moments before a big football match, with both parties running through team sheets of candidates and trying to chalk off rivals for past misdeeds. But now, as of 4pm Thursday, nominations are closed and the election battle can formally begin. So joining me today is one of the candidates, Brandon Lewis, a Home Office Minister and former Tory party chairman. I'll be asking him about the election pact that the Tories offered the Brexit party earlier this week. Plus, Liberal Democrat candidate Luciana Berger will reveal what it's like campaigning for a different party to the last election when she won a Labour seat. And Peter Udale, a former Brexit party candidate who pulled that last week, will be telling me why. And finally, Sir Anthony Selden, the historian and biographer of many Prime Ministers, will be joining me to talk about his biography of Theresa May. So, on with the show. Brandon Lewis, Conservative candidate for Great Yarmouth and a Home Office Minister. We had you on our podcast in July when you were the party chairman. Did you foresee becoming a Tory candidate so soon? <laughs> Maybe not quite this soon. I don't think any of us wanted to be in a general election. I think we wanted to get Brexit done and get on with delivering for people. But Parliament just came to this point where it was just completely broken. It was a farce. I actually think it became quite embarrassing to be involved with. So I think the Prime Minister had no choice. We had to have an election and let people uh, decide what they want to see it in the future. It was embarrassing to see you guys pushing to, to a dissolve parliament for an election and the Labour Labour opposition stopping you doing it. Well, I, I still struggle to get my head around a concept of an opposition party leader voting against a general election. I mean, the only purpose of being the leader of the opposition is to get a general election, and he was against it. But um, but that's the, the crazy situation that they got themselves into. And Parliament was a, an absolute standstill. Nothing was getting done, and we need to move forward. And the only way to do that, from our point of view, is to get a Conservative majority. So we need to have an election. Hopefully people will back us to get that majority, and then we can get on with business. And do you think uh, the Labour are ready for the election? Or, I mean, is it going well for them or, or, or better for you at the moment? Well, Jeremy Corbyn claims he's wanted an election for the last two years, although, when it, as you say, when he came to it, he didn't vote for it. So, you know, their own state of readiness is a, is a matter for them. We're just focused on our own campaign, and that's about getting out there, talking to residents, explaining to people across the country that not only do we want to, and the only way to see Brexit done is a Conservative majority, but that then allows us to get on to these other important domestic issues, investing in our infrastructure and our public services. We've got Luciana Berger on this podcast, and she's part of this Unite to Remain alliance. Do you regret not doing an agreement with the Brexit party to do a, a kind of Brexit alliance to deliver, in Nigel Farage's words, a 40-seat majority for both parties? No, not at all. Look, we're not doing deals with people. I, I think it's a bit um, a bit weird and a bit odd for people around the country that particularly main parties play in mm. these kind of games. In 60 seats, the... Yeah, uh, and, they, and you know, a lot of the Liberal Democrats and the Remain Alliance, they're playing games with people over one issue. Actually, Parliament is about more than just Brexit. It's about investing in education, health, our police service, our security services and but this is our the infrastructure. Brexit election, though, we, it, it is, but we, they, we want to get Brexit done so we can get on to all of these other important things. So it is important for us as a Conservative and Unionist party to be fighting elections in all constituencies to get a proper working majority. And the only way we do that is to fight these seats and that people vote for us to have that majority. The big concern for, for people who aren't as hard Brexit as some of the main, other party supporters is leaving the EU at the end of 2020 after a transition deal without a deal at all. Is that a worry you have? No, it's not. I think we will get a deal. The basis of the deal we've just secured, of course, the deal people said Boris couldn't secure, and he did it in under 90 days, I think, from uh, my calculations, I think shows we can do this. We've got the basis for it. We can go forward, get focused on it. And this is what's so great about the Prime Minister is he's not messing around. He's very clear. I want to get this done, get on with it, so we can focus on the other issues we all want to be talking about. So you about. can guarantee leaving by the end of January with a deal and then out by the end of December next year... 
Absolutely. altogether, if with people, or without it, with or without arrangement. If we have a conservative majority, we will leave the European Union in January, mm. and we will finish that deal, and we will leave the European Union after the implementation period at the end of December. The problem with those commitments aren't there that you would have made them, or, or Boris Johnson made them in the summer, and we didn't leave in the end of October, did he? So that, it, it no, does I, damage uh, the reputation of politics I when you say these things. And we, I how do you believe? I absolutely understand people's frustration. I can only say, I can assure you that you know, those in the cabinet share that frustration that we couldn't get this done. Parliament came to a standstill. Labour and Liberal Democrat MPs and the Remain Alliance kept playing silly games in Parliament, voting against these programme motions and all of this kind of silly things. That's why we need a clear majority, something we've not had for a long time. And then we can get this done and get focused on other issues as well. One of the big issues you're pushing this week is migration, which you'll bring down. Yep. But you're not saying net migration, you're not saying tens of thousands. You've junked that idea from the 2010-2015 well, manifestos. I, 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 think over, I think over the last few years, let's be you know quite frank about this, I think people have got frustrated again at politicians like me, and I've, I've done it, I was the immigration minister for a while, talking about these arbitrary targets. What we want to do is we just be very straight with people. That was we, a government policy. We, yeah, it was arbitrary, tar but, arbitrary targets. Yeah, but I, 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 and I made the point at the time that for me, those times were always actually really about control. People wanted to know the government had control. What we're able to set out here is if we get a conservative majority, we can leave the European Union. That brings gets rid of free movement. But we can also introduce this points-based system. We need a majority to do that. That will mean we have proper control of a fair system for the entire world. And that means we can reduce migration. Do you worry that in your constituency you have EU migrants who are here and they can't get the right to remain? They're worried that if they're not, not here beyond uh, having to, uh, signed up by January, they can't stay for five years or whatever? Uh, no, because I haven't had that. But let me, it's a good chance to also just clarify how this works. The European Union Settlement Scheme, uh, people don't have to, that runs until December 2020. So people have got plenty of time to apply. We're over 2 million now. I think getting on for 2.5 million have, have already applied. So we're well, well on the way to pretty much having that completed. And that gives people that security and certainty. It's really simple, it's easy, it's quick. And I would encourage people to get on and do it. But I've not had people coming to me in my constituency about this. And what is quite, I think, sad is sometimes the Labour Party and others do some scaremongering about this. But it's a simple scheme. It's like renewing your driving licence or your passport, quick and easy to do online, gives people that security. We want those citizens to stay here. They're part of our community, part of our country. And that's why we've put this simple, clear scheme in place. And we can get past Brexit, do you think? I mean, there's so much more that the Tories agree on and disagree on. And when you see your colleagues like David Gork, now an independent, saying vote Lib Dem, Philip Hammond leaving politics at the moment, I mean, it's it's sad, isn't it? Well, it's always sad to lose any colleague. I think it's also just worth uh, clarifying, there's also a big difference. What we're seeing in our party is that some of our colleagues have had a disagreement on a particular policy issue. And we all want to get that done and move on to things where, as you say, we agree on everything and we can drive forward. What we're seeing with the Labour Party, of course, is they disagree on a huge range of things from immigration right the way through to welfare. And Labour MPs leaving the Labour Party, not over policy, but over the fact that their leader is totally unfit to lead this country. And even just his comments yesterday on the uh, leader of ISIL and his, and his death, actually effectively questioning, in my opinion, um, what the Americans quite as clear, have said. as you say, was it? But, no, uh, but, no, but if you look at what he actually said in that interview, I would say my intonation of it was he was almost questioning what the US has said. I think it's a pretty disgraceful position for a leader in opposition. If somebody wants to lead our country and protect our security, after the position he took with Russia as well, I understand why Labour MPs are saying, you can't trust this well, the man. the issue of character will come up with um, Jeremy Corbyn in the TV debates next week. Do you feel sorry for Boris Johnson at the moment when he goes out to the flood areas and he's trying to meet with people and they shout at him? Do you feel a degree of sympathy with him? Yeah, because look, I was the flood recovery ministry in 2013-14 where we had the East Coast tidal surge hit my constituents who actually lost properties and then obviously the Somerset levels. Uh, when people are experiencing that, <clears throat> it is devastating, particularly at this time of year, the, the destruction that water and nature can bring. Um, the Prime Minister went out to Derbyshire last week. He's obviously been in Yorkshire this week. All the way through, he has been in control of making sure that councils have got the support they need with what we call the Bellwin scheme, putting schemes in place for businesses and individuals. But look, when you go and meet people who are suffering from this, they are angry, they are upset. Um, that's one of the things we just have to deal with and get used to. And I understand why they react like that. But I think it's an indication of Boris does care about these people. He wants to know this is being done right. That's why he's been up there and why he's been so focused on making sure they've got the support they need. He seemed more sure-footed when that dam nearly broke early, early, early this year, but he seemed a bit, he was slow to, to call it a national emergency, slow to well, bring no, back no, no, Cobra. I, actually, look, I think that's a bit unfair. I'll challenge that, Chris. Look, he was being 
leading and driving this from the very beginning. Last week, he was up in one of the worst hit places in Derbyshire. So it's unfair to say he wasn't there. He was there and he has been involved making sure that people have what they need. There's also a really important balance point here. And I remember this when I was the minister about areas need that space and time for the emergency services to do the work they need to do without the distraction. Yeah, exactly. Without that distraction of uh, people getting in the way. So you've got to get the timing right when you're, you're able to go there and see what people need and talk to people without getting in the way of the important work that has yeah. to be done. Time. And just on tax cuts, one of the big things that uh, Boris Johnson mentioned when he became leader was he wants to raise the high rate threshold to £80,000 a year. So you're well, like, tempting me I'm tempting into, into, into teasing chat about you with some of the manifesto. And I think I think the just anticipation the pub, no and the patience to wait for that will make it all worthwhile when you see that excellent document. Now, finally, Brandon Lewis, you're the former chairman of the Tory party. You know numbers, you know forecasts. How big is your majority going to be? Uh, I think we can get a Conservative majority. I'm not playing, I've never played the numbers game in local elections or, 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 or national elections. But actually for us, we've got to be focused on working hard in those constituencies to get people to vote. Look, we're asking people on December the 12th to leave their home, what could be a very cold, even wet or snowy day, depending yes. on where you are, to take a positive action, to go to a polling station and tick the Conservative box. We've got to work hard to earn those votes and give them a positive reason to do it. I think we can do that, but we do need people to turn out and vote. Brandon Lewis, once again, thank you for coming on Chopper's Election Podcast. Thank My you. My pleasure. My next guest has had a very interesting political journey in 2019. She started the year as Labour MP, then she helped to found the Independent Group for Change, and now she's a Lib Dem candidate at the 2019 general election. And as part of that, she's also supporting this Unite to Remain campaign, which means that there's a coalition across 60 seats between the Greens and Plaid and the Lib Dems, where they won't field rival candidates. I'm joined now by Luciana Berger, who's standing in this election. She's moved seats and joined the Liberal Democrats. Luciana, welcome to Chopper's Election Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me on your fantastic you're, podcast. You've got your coffee there and I've got mine. Yes. I'm turning into a Corbynista. I'm so delayed by the trains today. I want to nationalise everything again. But of course, you've left the Labour Party now and now you've joined the Lib Dems. But you're part of this group called Unite to Remain, aren't you? To bring together... Vote. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a national uh, initiative mm. um, that is uh, has brought together parties that, and in fact, invited parties to take part in. Um, and in the end, it was the Plaid Cymru, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats who together um, worked to identify 60 seats. Yes. Um, where... Well, you won't stand on, anyone on the, on the ballot there's, a, there's only one United to Remain candidate as an initiative it brings those parties together uh, the Labour Party was invited to take part and it's obviously highly regrettable that mm. uh, they dismissed it immediately but um, mm. also there's been a very strong as you would anticipate local decision making within parties so in Finchley and Golders Green local Green Party members were balloted to ask them um, whether they were prepared to step aside and they chose to do so. Uh, would it work do you think? I, mean, I think it's certainly an important um contributing factor to this campaign yeah. this uh, election uh, I was knocking on doors yesterday uh, there was many Green Party members Green Party supporters who were aware of the initiative yeah. and who knew that I was the Remain candidate you know, I'm, as part of the Liberal Democrats we are a party that wants to remain You've got 60 candidates supporting at the moment will it be more than that will it be any kind of paper candidates or is that the limit of the, of the size of the, of, the, of the alliance Nominations closed today so um, no it's, 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 it's 60 seats across uh, the country where those won't, won't be more than that. It won't be more than that. No. What What do you make of um, Liberal Democrat voters compared to Labour ones? Well, I'm I'm struck by the number of both Labour voters and Conservative voters that are supporting me at this and yeah. the Liberal Democrats at this future general election. People that reject uh, the two main parties who have gravitated towards the fringes. Uh, the Conservative Party, you know, rejected it as um, essentially left its one nation conservatism, the Brexit Party in all but name, and the Labour Party that's feared to the hard left mm. uh, with Jeremy Corbyn at its helm. People want an alternative, a real choice. Yes. Um, you know, Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn isn't a, cho- a real choice. And in Joe Swinson and the Liberal Democrats, they've got a party that's very clear where it stands and, and is providing that alternative for a brighter future for our country. Is it an easy, an easy fit for you, given you, you grew up in the Labour tradition and then you were forced out by that appalling treatment of you uh, over anti-Semitism? I mean, is it an easy fit for you in the Lib Dems? Parties evolve. Parties don't stand still. Our politics doesn't stand still. And 
you, know, you hope that parties evolve and improve for the better. It's regrettable that in, in both the main parties, we've seen them evolve for the worse. Yeah. Uh, and if I was looking to get involved in politics, as I did 20 years ago as a, as a student, you know, where would I want to get involved? The only party I could consider today is the Liberal Democrats. Mm. In your seat, are you the only Remain candidate? Absolutely. Uh, the Tory candidate, yes, said that he supported Remain, but he wants to implement the referendum. He's so he's served, not as far, as far as you're yeah, concerned. He's yeah, served yeah. as a, a whip in Boris Johnson's government. He's delivering Boris Johnson's hard Brexit. That's yeah. the choice that he's made in, in a constituency, which was one of the strongest Remain constituencies in the country, mm. almost 70% of whom voted to stay in the European Union at the referendum in 2016 on current polling puts it much higher yeah. than that. And uh, you know, people want in their representative someone that's going to stand up uh, on behalf of their views. And Joe Swinson can be PM, can she? Like, like um, on my, um, I'm at least at home, she says she'll, she'll be PM. Is it just candidate for prime minister? Absolutely, because yeah. this country deserves a real choice. And yeah. as I said, you know, uh, the the alternative is no alternative at all. I mean, the number of doorsteps I'm on where people say, "Oh, can't can't work out what's worse," mm-hmm. uh, when they're looking at Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, and it's right that people have a real choice, and it is absolutely correct. And is that people, realistic, you think? Let, let's look at some previous electoral events that no one anticipated, no one expected in 2015 that. The Labour Party would be wiped out in Scotland in all but one seat. MPs who were sat on majorities of over 30,000 who left their seats in the moment, lost their seats in, overnight. Uh, in 2017, no one predicted the outcome of that general election. No. Uh, and, you know, many, even, even 2016 was a big surprise, I think, to a lot of people on the, refer- on the referendum. Yeah, and the most recent Democratic event, the European election 2017, where for the first time in 100 years, the Liberal Democrats beat both the Labour Party and the Conservatives. Um, you know, in some parts of the country, the, the Brexit Party came above them. In in London, where I'm a candidate, the Liberal Democrats came top. Yeah. Um, no one anticipated that. No one anticipated the Liberal Democrats picking up hundreds of seats right across the country. And the poll I'll be looking at is the one that we see on the 12th of December. You've got a good chance, you think? Absolutely. Today you're pushing your gender pay policies, aren't you? And we're, there's somewhere to go 60 years before that gap is closed, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, how will you accelerate that, that gap closing? So yes, today we're talking specifically about how we want to um, really achieve for our country that open, inclusive and equal society that uh, we really aspire to and is at the heart of Liberal Democrat values. And I'm really excited and delighted that that is at the core of what the party stands for and what we're putting forward at this election, because we certainly don't see it regrettably in mm. the other two main parties. We also meet today on 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 that very specific day where um, uh, that gender came back, that gender pay gap exists and this is the date by which um, women's pay um, uh, stops in terms of how much they earn in comparison to women. We've seen that the gap goes a little bit over the course of the past year but we've still got so much more progress to make and we've said that we want companies with over 250 employees uh, to be doing a lot more monitoring, to be both publishing their employment levels and also their pay levels for women but not just for women also but looking at the... face sanction if they don't or... So the first step is to have that to have that progress to have the, you know, that, that mm. real transparency, and it isn't just about gender; it's also about um, people from BAME backgrounds, and um, also the LGBT plus community, and also for parents who want those larger companies to be publishing their figures when it comes to parental leave, uh, when it when it comes to um, parents taking shared parental leave as well, to mm. understand to what extent and um, the disparities exist, because we certainly know there's some fantastic enlightened employers, but that isn't all employers and actually there's so much more we can be doing in our workplaces to achieve equality across our country. Well, this is Anna, Anna Berger. And the question that Brexit has always asked me about Lib Dems, is, is it not anti-democratic to want to reverse the vote of 2016? I mean, the 17.4 million people voted to leave and now the, the Lib Dem, Liberal Democrats, wants to cancel out that vote. Well, the people that voted to leave, um, they're not a homogenous group. And people voted for lots of different reasons, lots of different motivations. I certainly meet all the time. In fact, just on the doorstep last night, a man who did vote to leave and is appalled that he feels betrayed because the promises and pledges that were made to him, even if they were made in good faith, in reality cannot be delivered. So that's why we've argued for and campaigned for a people's vote. I think the best analogy anyone shared with me was um, when you go for an operation, you give informed consent at the very last moment, all the way way through and right at the very end. And I think it's highly regrettable that, you know, the country wasn't told that we were going to have this hard Brexit. You know, Theresa May's deal wasn't Brexity enough for Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson's deal wasn't Brexity enough for Nigel Farage. He's come in behind it in the last few days, but still, you know, he has his reservations. If the government is so convinced that this is what the country wants, then take it back to the country. You know, democracy doesn't and stand still. risk more uncertainty. 
Well, it's not more uncertainty. It's the clarity and the confirmation that there's something so significant for our country for decades it's to come. It's definitely wanted. It's definitely wanted, isn't it? Lishana Bird, thank, thank you so much on a busy morning in Westminster for coming on, on Chopper's Election Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, in just a moment, I'll be joined by Peter Udale, a former Brexit Party candidate, right after this. Hello, I'm Mick Brown, and I write for The Telegraph magazine. That means I spend my days with my head deep in books and trawling Google and writing profiles, interviews and investigative stories. This year, I've been writing about psychedelic drugs as a possible cure for the world's greatest public health crisis, depression. And in a world exclusive with my colleague Robert Mendick, I tracked down and exposed India's most wanted man, the diamond dealer Nirav Modi, who was accused of embezzling $2 billion from one of India's biggest banks. But stories like these take time. And as we all know, time means money. That's where our subscribers come in. Without them, we just can't write the stories you enjoy reading or make podcasts like this one. So if you'd like to support what we're doing and to get unlimited access to the huge range of quality journalism on politics, business, lifestyle and more, go to telegraph.co.uk slash chopper where we have a special listener offer. You can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online and then after that it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash chopper or click on the link in the show notes to this episode. Joining me now in the Red Lion pub is Peter Udale, Brexit party candidate for the Cotswolds until he stood down last week and urged voters to back the Tories. Peter, welcome to Chopper's Election Podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me on. Thank you for coming on. Are you a Brexit martyr? I you, uh, you, you jumped before you were pushed, didn't you? Because you jumped, you quit the Brexit party days before um, Nigel Farage basically would have sacked you anyway. He, Discuss. He would have. He would have sacked me. I, I'm sure. Yes, along with the other 317, 16. 16 or seventeen. I'm not quite sure, but I felt it was an important moment, and and the worry that I had is that we were trundling along towards a situation where the Brexit Party was going to field six hundred mm. odd candidates, and that was going to present a real risk to Brexit. And secondly, a real risk of getting Jeremy Corbyn in number 10. Not a real risk, though, in your seat, where you're standing against Jeff- Geoffrey Clifton Brown, who's the treasurer of a 1922 committee of Tory MPs, and it's one of the handful of top safest seats in the country. I mean, it, essentially, it was a futile gesture. You're standing in the first place, Peter. Well, um, I, you don't know. I think polls, polls are quite fluid. I, I think one can't tell exactly how things are going to turn out. I mean, the Tory parties seem to be quite capable... Uh, of of potential gaffes, you know, loads of gaffes. As witness ever passed. Yeah, and, you know, we've, we've got the Russian thing sitting there that people aren't quite sure, you know, how much money's been going into the Tory coffers. You know, when people start to focus on, on how the Tories have performed over the last five years, when it comes down to sort of austerity, on funding for schools, you know, the, the, I think there are plenty of issues. Um, the introduction of universal credit and the complete botched attempt to do that a good idea, though. Most people agree, don't they? Apart from la- Labour, but sitting on the Tory side, that everyone likes that. But it showed how how um, how separate they were from ordinary people. They mm. they introduced it on the basis of monthly payments rather than weekly payments, and forcing many people who were already in in poverty into even further and penury. Still that problem with those four weeks not being paid at all, which is yeah. the, is the awful awful introduction to the scheme if you're starting it. It was extraordinary. And it seemed like a Philip Hammond type thing. You know, I think... It makes in, sense logically if you've got money to burn. A- absolutely. But if you haven't he, any money, what, what can you do? He was really focused on the numbers, making sure that, you know, they were getting in on their on their budget numbers mm. and the deficit and reducing that. Mm. Um, and and I think they, they lost sight of the big picture. But that said, you're going to vote Tory in campaign for Jeff- Jeffrey Clifton-Brown, despite what you're saying about the Tory party. Um, yeah, well, I'm actually also, I'm registered in, in uh, Kensington as well, oh, are which you? is a slightly more marginal seat. So I actually might exercise my vote um, in, you know, in one constituency. Where it matters more. In, in, yeah, where it matters more. Um, but I think you know, we're going to be doing campaigning. And, and it, was, it was really interesting, the, the group of people that we had um, 
in the Brexit party in, in the Cotswolds, which I guess may not be wholly representative of the whole country. But it was interesting. We had six meetings around our constituency where we talked to people and asked them. And I think we did more meetings, actually, probably than anybody else in the Brexit party to find out what people really thought. And, and the issue that just came up time and time again was, one, we're in danger of losing Brexit. Is Nigel really right about this deal? Is it really as bad as we seem? I mean, here was a man at one stage who was in favour of the Norway deal, you know, which would have done pretty much precisely the, the same thing. In fact, what it would have done, it would have locked us into a lot of EU rules with even less say over things. So, so now that Boris has come along, you know, and negotiated this bev- a better deal, he's pivoted towards a, a free trade deal. He's sort of got rid of the backstop. The question is, at what point do people say, well, this is enough, this is OK, and we should just move on? And the general feeling seemed to be in those meetings that we should move on. And actually, people were hugely relieved. When I made the decision, people were hugely relieved because it sort of took the decision out of their hands and actually they felt, yep, we can move on. And yet, Nigel Nigel Farage is standing in 300 seats, including the 40 Tory seats that they're targeting, are Labour-held seats at the moment. They're Labour-held seats, indeed, yes. Um, Those Labour marginals. And, and, And that's, I think that still presents a risk. Because we still don't know how this election's going to pan out. Has his ego gotten away, do you think? I, I think they've, they've built up this hugely professional party. They've hired all these candidates who are complete, you know, we go down and have meetings with, with Nigel and he's hugely motivational. You know, it is very, very much evangelical. Mm. Um, and they want to get out there and they want to do that. And, and lots of Brexit supporters are emailing them and saying, yep, yeah, you know, we really want you to stand. So I think that, you know, it's hugely difficult to now back off and, and say, you know, this isn't, you know, for the for the right thing for the country, we should he drop He told me last seats. night, Wednesday night, he's, he's got 270 candidates already got their papers in, 30 left to go. So it looks like it's a done deal now that the Brexit party will be standing seats in in marginals, the Tories have to win, and it could yeah. be a problem. It, you know, I think it still potentially puts things at risk. I, I would have much preferred to to have gone for the forty to fifty targeted seats, yeah. um, and it, you know, from, from your article yesterday and from conversations I've had with well, with that Tory is definitely MPs. on the table. The problem they've got is if they do fewer than I think it's 100, 110 or so, they don't become a national party anymore, and they lose. I think I think there's a certain amount of media uh, access they lose or something. But then it goes back to this whole country before party question and you know and that's what we as candidates have been told all the way through and he talks about that yeah doesn't he yeah he does all all the time and the question is is he making that decision you know for the country or or is he you know making it for the party you know the objections i think he had to the to the withdrawal agreement and the and the political declaration were mostly about the transition you know, they, they didn't seem anything like as substantial as they were under Theresa May's deal. So we've, we've moved on. And, you know, he hasn't really wanted to accept that, I think, whereas I think many people He's had have. an extraordinary year, the Brexit Party, hasn't it? I mean, formed in, in March, uh, winning a national election in May, nearly winning a pretty for a by-election, effectively, I think, I think, forcing out Theresa May because the Tory MPs had to act, yeah. bringing in a candidate who has got a harder deal. I mean, it's been an amazing year, for Nigel Farage, hasn't it really? It has. And and once again, you know, he may end up with with no candidate, but having shifted the whole mm. he made a seismic change to, to British politics. Should he choose take the peerage then, Peter? Um, so well, I have been offered one. I don't know whether that's still on offer. Actually, I, I'm I'm not sure. But 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 from my perspective, I think he he genuinely deserves it. You know, he's he sort of you know you you have to put him alongside Margaret Thatcher. I think in the way that he's changed British politics. And, and uh, what's next for you, Peter? You'll you'll be campaigning, but you'll, what do you do for a living? Are you... Well, I I retired about. Um... Five years ago, I ran a risk management business, and, and you know, and that may have had some sort of Im- <laughs> influence on on my decision, which which was ex- I found extremely difficult. It, it wasn't an easy decision because you know we'd gone through Theresa May to Theresa May's deal, and and it felt like yeah we had to fight against that. But when Boris came along and he changed the mood, he changed the vision, and he changed the direction of the Tory Party, it felt like we should do something. I, I would say that there is still a huge amount of suspicion about Boris and about the deal and about um, whether it actually will be delivered. And I think there's a hole in the Tory party's argument at this stage about what happens at December 2020 
is no deal on the table or is it not? Because Michael Gove's arguing, we're going to do a deal. Brandon Lewis is arguing, we're going to do a deal. But actually, there is no certainty we're going to do a deal. And just finally, Peter, do you encourage other candidates to do what you do, even though papers have gone in? They could they could stand down in some of those those Labour seats where they're, where they're marginals? I think it's totally a matter of conscience. I think you have to make your own decision about this. Even after the, the papers have gone in? Um, well, withdraw and uh, say, back the Tory. Well, p- people are getting pressure. I can see people are getting pressure from, from both sides. You know, there are Brexiteers who want them to stand and say they really don't want to vote for the Tories, you know, who, who are tribal, um, you know, who might vote for Labour, who would normally vote for Labour, who might vote for the, for the Brexit party, but they will never vote for the, for the Tory party. So I guess the key, key decision for the Conservative Party, how many, how many people is it going to lose, mm. you know? Well, Peter Udell, thank you so much for coming in on to Chopper's election podcast. You're um, very welcome. And You're very welcome. enjoy campaigning for the Tory party. OK, thanks very much. Cheers. And finally, I think it's fair to say that former PM Theresa May, a candidate in this election, don't forget, was always something of an enigma. She didn't give many interviews, well, apart from me in 2017 at the election, wasn't a fan of personal questions, and kept her cards fairly close to her chest. So what's it like trying to write her biography? Sir Anthony Selden is a historian, university vice-chancellor, and the author of a new book, May at 10, which chronicles the former PM's life in Number 10 Downing Street. And he joins me now on Chopper's Election podcast, Anthony Selden, thank you for coming onto the podcast here in the Red Lion pub. Do you think Theresa May had the character to be Prime Minister? I think she did, Christopher, but she didn't have the character to be Prime Minister in 2016. She was somebody who could have helped restore trust in the nation. She was extraordinarily thoughtful, um, compassionate, caring, master of detail, but she was a a miniaturist. She had no strategic vision. So to her, Brexit was a problem to be solved and got out of the way. There was no vision for Britain's place in the world uh, after Brexit, nor was there any understanding of how difficult it would be to get Brexit through. So Uh, She's very good one-on-one, very good campaigning uh, in the street, but not good on television, not good uh, speaking in public, not good persuading cabinet, not very good uh, even chairing cabinet. She doesn't jolly people along. It's not a, a bundle of laughs when you're with her. And the power of the prime minister is substantially, like with the American president, the power to persuade. So not the skills and character required for the job in hand. Uh, and I was noted there that on the, when she heard about the result of the 2016 referendum, and I was actually there when she mm. announced that she was a Remainer, yeah. it was like listening to a long legal judgment yeah. argued both sides. And the yeah. final paragraph said, she said she'd vote Remain on yeah. security ground, I think from memory. But she said, didn't she, in quotes, the ones who voted for Brexit were the ones who suffered the most and started crying. I mean, mm. that's, that's hardly grabbing the, the sunny uplands of Brexit, is it? Well, I think that makes the point, doesn't it? On the biggest issue of the day, in the biggest issue actually for this country in 100 years domestically, um, do we leave the EU and if so, how? She had no clear and settled view. She had no clear view about whether she wanted to leave, how she was going to leave or what what Britain's future would be once one had left. And she didn't know how to relate to the EU or to cabinet either. So she relied heavily on AIDS for ideas, didn't she? And lost the AIDS after 2017. And did she become captured by the civil service? as we often thought as journalists at the time. What do you, was that what okay, you found? So, so, so the book powerfully defends the quality of Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill. They were dumped on by her, and I think that was part of her problem. Actually, these were the two people who made her into the Prime Minister. Without them, she wouldn't have had the, the, the ambition, the know-how to make it into number 10. I mean, in many ways, she was an accidental prime minister, of course, because Boris and Michael Gove, um, both of whom uh, were far more suited to the job and both of whom would have got Brexit through uh, earlier on, they dropped out. And, you know, she took, uh, she she blamed them, I think, uh, unfairly and unwisely, missing the fact that they were... Uh, disguising the fact that key parts of her skill set that you need as a prime minister were being provided by them. To be fair to 
to her. And MPs before that period mm. blamed Nick mm. Timothy and Fiona Hill for keeping them isolated from her, didn't yeah. they? They saw those two individuals as gatekeepers to, yeah. to getting to her. So well, uh, she's it, repeating, really, or she's acknowledging what MPs were saying about them at the time. Yeah, uh, correct. Had she been a more confident person, she, you know, they, they were keeping her safe because they worried that she wouldn't have anything to say. And of course, uh, the elephant of, uh, elephant in the room, the moment of colossal, blinding, unbelievably embarrassing truth came in the 2017 uh, election when the whole world saw that uh, there wasn't very much there on the public stage. You know, she's all the good things that I talked about, but she could not cope uh, with the big stage. And to have, <laughs> imagine that you could base a whole general election on the character of the the, the most socially awkward prime minister uh, for 100 years uh, was, was a, a, a miscalculation. I was struck by covering her as prime minister how she would always talk about modern slavery as the which is a big a massive deal but it was a very small part of of home office policy when you look at all the security issue and police state and yeah. everything else but that was one thing she would always go back to i felt that she didn't really have a grip on the big picture as prime minister she tended to go into the money show all the time yeah no i think that's that's fair and she she was uh, very much uh, is very much the the daughter of, of a clergyman she has a profound christian faith and that came out in a concern for uh, the least advantaged in exactly society. Right. Now, exactly. now, in many ways, this is much more akin to a, to a Labour uh, prime minister than to a Conservative one. But but she didn't really know how to operationalise them. They were instincts, and there were many other uh, huge causes, including uh, social care, including housing, which, never got which she just in. didn't get. And uh, and she, uh, I do describe in in the. Uh, book it hasn't come out in any of the reviews that 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 it was a Shakespearean tragedy in which the hero heroine learnt during the course of this journey, but actually learnt too late how to be prime minister. She became a much more instinctive figure uh, by the end, and there was something rather glorious and heroic about her in the last six months, battling away to get the deal, taking mm. blow after blow to the head and to the body, and still battling on. Now, Anthony Selden, you've done loads of these books. You've done books on on Blair and Major, Brown at 10, Cameron at 10, now you've got May at 10. You're starting work on Boris at 10 or Johnson at 10, however you describe it. What lessons could you could he learn from reading your the books? If he may not have time now he's in government to or he's leading the party. Um, what lessons would you give him if he were well, listening to this podcast? Uh, to be himself. If, if Theresa May had been herself uh, she could have done the job much better. That was what she learned to be. You know, but Grenfell was awful. She she listened to advisers, police advice, don't go. Actually, when she was in front of the survivors, she was incredibly no one saw good and, away from and the nobody saw it. So, so she didn't, wasn't herself. Boris is much more intuitive uh, as a figure. Uh, there's hardly been a starker contrast between uh, her and Boris Johnson than, than any of the 54 changes of prime minister before that. We've had 300 years of prime minister. Be yourself trust yourself uh, and, you know, leave time for yourself. I think Boris ought to write history books uh, when he's there. Leave the detail to other people and just keep with the big picture. What's your because, advice to J- Jeremy Corbyn or Joe Swinson? They could be PM as well. Well, they, uh, they, they could show some humi- humility and understand history. It's the lack of an understanding of history. I and mean, Boris has it. I mean, his history, of course, is 2,000 years ago rather than... Uh, and I, I would advise him to, to write books, to keep reading, do what he loves best and keep way above the fray. Look at that big picture because the big lesson of Theresa May is if you keep down there in the mud, you get covered by mud and eventually you'll get lost in the mud. Adney Selden, thank you for coming on Chopper's Election Podcast. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's all for today. Huge thanks to my guests, Banda Lewis, Luciana Berger, Peter Udale, and Sir Anthony Selden. Thank you to the podcast producers, Theo Ludis and Elliot Lampitt. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. Listener of the week this week is Stan. You gave us a rave review for our interview this week with David Starkey. You loved it, didn't you, Stan? But you gave us four stars, not five. Stan, please think again. And if you haven't already, please do join Stan in subscribing and leaving us a review. It really helps other people find this show. 
If you want to get in touch, do tweet us at Brexit Broadcast or email us choppersbrexitpodcast at telegraph.co.uk. And we're always keen for new ideas of people to interview, including Labour candidates who are a bit reluctant to appear, and we're trying to encourage them. If you haven't already, please go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper, where you can get 30 days access to all of our brilliant content completely free of charge. And we'll stick that link in the show notes to this podcast as well, as well as a link to one of my favourite pieces online this week at the Telegraph website, everything you need to know about the Tory offer to Nigel Farage. And always, always buy your copy on the Daily Telegraph. It's brilliant. Until next time, cheerio! Hello there, Telegraph podcast listener. My name is Tom Gibbs and I'm the host of our Audio Football Club podcast. If your desire for top football chat isn't sated, then may I please recommend the Telegraph's very own podcast about that subject. Audio Football Club comes out every single Monday and it features some of the best and brightest football minds in the country, taking in all the biggest stories from the Premier League and around Europe. Search for Audio Football Club wherever you get your podcasts or follow the link in the description of this episode. Good things will happen to you if you do so.